it's um, can we get a break? Can we just get a breakdown of everything and, and how that or even for if we're just running a day Yes. Uh, just a reminder, um, and this is not by Department of Policy, besides making sure that all your key card expenses for camp have been cleared before you reconcile your camp, your SDG2 account has to be cleared. We will not make sure that you get paid for camp if you have outstanding university expenses on your SDG2 account. So make sure that before you go to reconcile camp that you have done an SDG2 not only for any camp expenses, but that your SDG2 account is clear and free of all expenses. Well, and glad you're, that reminded me of something. Make sure you charge the right folk. Uh, you know, afterwards, I, after we reconcile, you know, we're finding that expenses hit, you know, the regular fund instead of a camp or a clinic. And then, so then we have to come back at you to recover those monies to um, pay back your regular fund. And correct me if I'm wrong, that's happening mostly with the print shop? Yes, the, the past charges were found under print shop, correct. Uh, because I have, I can change, I will find things if it's not done right on STG2. But you need to make sure if you go through the print shop for anything, if you just say, oh, yeah, this is for basketball camp, and you don't give them the basketball camp phone, they're just going to use your regular phone. Yes. Because that's all they know. So when you go over there for whether it's brochures or T-shirts or whatever you're using them for, you are responsible for making sure that you give them the proper camp phone yes. um, for those charges. Because that is where we are having problems. Because they don't know your camp phone. They're, they're just like all of us. They have other jobs. So their job is to not make sure that you're giving them the proper phone if you don't tell them that. So make sure that you give them the camp phone that's appropriate for the brochures or the t-shirts or whatever. Yes. What is the phone again? The fund, board, account, and program. You can always when contact you me, yeah. Budget, mm -hmm. When you fill out your budget, your MOAP is at the top of that budget form. Yes. So it's just a normal one. It's a yes. it your, your camp goal is totally different than your regular operating budget. With your regular operating budget, <laughs> you'll know the fund is always 30006. For camp, it's 100001. Your org is different than the program code will be different. Are you, are you okay? It's like, I, I know, like, for instance, we have a conflict plan and we have this event. Um, I know I'm not going to be able to reconcile that plan until mid February. But is it okay if we turn in PAS for the trainers, for our assistant coaches? Absolutely. That's always okay. Okay. Yes. I, I mean, that's, that that's always clear. preferred. That yes. As, yes. Well. As, as long as you always pay everybody that works for you. Yeah. Prior to the camp director reconciling, yeah. then you know that's easier to check. Okay, this you know this matches, this matches. Uh -huh. Yes, and then um, always make sure to follow up with Nancy if they're biweekly or a monthly, um, and be mindful of the pay periods. You know when a biweekly schedule gets paid versus a monthly person, because um, it always takes I would say at least a week for the PAF to run its rounds before it can get processed. And the PAFs are located in HR. I might have some at the office, but I can't guarantee that I'll have some. I know Ava has some sometimes. And I never have any. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? Any more for questions? Albert or me? All right, thank mm -hmm. you. So I just want to recap basically what Denise was talking about. 
um, make sure you please make an appointment with her by email. Um, send her when she's available because she does have other job responsibilities for campus. So if you guys are ready to settle your camp and reconcile it, please email her and set up a time for that. Um, that's important. Um, so she can, she can schedule you within her busy schedule. So she, she's, she's working, so. Yes? I'll get it out to you because I want to we have some other things that I want to settle uh, like the forms and that kind of stuff for the summer camp so I'm going to put all that into one document so we have one thing that settles all of our questions today I'm, I'm keeping a note here for you so so there's not individual ones going out every time so you want to go now? Yeah. all right uh, next up is um, Elise no PJ uh, about NCA compliance and forms Mike already started a little bit with the form changes that we've had. Um, so as a reminder, when you're submitting the authorization form, we do need copies of advertisements included. So the majority of you are using Jump Forward as your advertisements, which is great. Print out a copy of that screen for me or include the link so that we have access to it and we can view it. Uh, if you add any additional advertisements after the approval, including Instagram graphics, Snapchat graphics, Twitter graphics, anything you're emailing out, that all has to be approved. Um, so I've seen some lately that we've used as educational experiences that were not necessarily compliant. So please make sure that everything you are using to promote your camps and clinics is submitted to our office prior to publishing it, okay? We cannot have pictures of our current student athletes on any camp materials if they are identifiable. So it's incredibly important that we have that in hand and have the ability to review it prior to issuance. Any questions on that, on what types of things we need to see? <clears throat> any type of advertisement for your camp has to come through us before it is purchased, published, sent out. Um, so with the preliminary schedule of events, that's the second requirement on this checklist. Uh, we need a camp schedule. Uh, you guys should be submitting that anyway when you're doing your facility reservations. We are just double checking it. Um, sometimes we found some concerns with different types of presentations we were having. It's a lot easier for us if we see it on the front end, we can make those adjustments and move forward accordingly. So please make sure that you have a preliminary schedule of events attached. If it is listed on your Jump Forward website or listed in your brochures, that's sufficient for me. You don't need to um, going back to the email blast, do we need to send you like a template for what we would send out as an email blast to our jump board? If you're sending it out to those not of age to receive electronic correspondence, I definitely want to make sure there's no recruiting language in there. So if you want to run a draft past me, if you use that same template every year, that's fine. We'll just approve it once, but I do want to see those drafts going out as well. Um, I know that Aaron sent me one already this week. I know we've worked with some before, JJ, so we've, we've got a few of them that are already pretty standard. PJ. If I'm doing more than one camp, do I have to do more than one form? Yes. <laughs> Great question. If you are doing more than one camp, you do have to complete an individual form for each camp. Um, now, we have some situations that are a little bit more unique. Like baseball had a series, um, and they could register for individual dates within that series or the series as a whole. That is okay to be on one form, but any other camp, PJ's question was great. That is going to be an individual form. Even if they're occurring on the same day. Like, well, we did it twice, but yep. getting a yep. completely different. Mm -hmm. Potentially different registration information. So we would like different forms for that. Um, so the third one on here, the staff approval form. So we will update that wording on the front. This is the one that Mike showed you already. Please do not fill in the gray column. We grade that out. We move that to the side. That is for Mike Cherry to complete. Um, that is not something that anyone should fill in. So we've had a lot of these forms submitted with yeses for all the background checks and they haven't had background checks. So please make sure that is for Mike Cherry's use only. Uh, this does need to be submitted with the approval for or authorization form and again, 14 days prior to the camp. Um, you have to, from what I can see on the forms for camps and conferences, you do have to submit headcounts 14 days in advance. So you should have a pretty good idea of what your staffing needs are at that point as well. So that's when we want the updated list. Please indicate their affiliation on this form. I need to know if they're Stetson, if they're a student athlete, if they're a student manager, 
if they are a junior college coach, a high school coach, um, we have a handful of sports now that have IWP, so individuals associated with prospect legislation, that affects who we can and cannot hire. So please make sure you clearly indicate their affiliation when you're submitting your forms. Likely, if they're not a Stetson affiliated person, I will have more questions for them, well, for our camp staff, um, for information that we need to get to determine whether or not they're individuals associated with our prospects. So that is important. It is also important that I have estimated pay um, for outside, for our student athletes and for our uh, outside employees. If coaches are getting percentages, you can just put percentage signs in, I don't have a problem with that. But for outside employees, so non-Stetson coaches, non-Stetson director of operations, I need to know what they're getting paid. At the conclusion of the camp, so within two business days, I need the reduced or free admission form submitted. If you did not provide any discounts, you still need to submit a form. Just submit it blank and say, not applicable. We do need to have this reconciliation form. There have been very few people that have actually been following through and trying to sit. Along with this form, you need to print out your registration information from Jump Forward, listing the value each participant paid for the camp. So that is a quick Excel export in Jump Forward. All you have to do, you can attach it to the email with this form and send it in to us. Yeah, it's gonna be, so we, I've already updated these on the Google Drive, but when Mike sends out all of the forms, we're gonna make sure that you have the new ones. The one thing with our compliance office, I think you guys know this by now, always download the new forms from the Google Drive, because a lot of times when legislation changes or when institutional procedures change, we have to tweak those forms. So anytime you're going to use a form, please make sure you download it directly from the Google Drive and you're not using one that you have saved already in your email or on a computer. Also, within two business days after the camp, I need a camp staff reconciliation form. So on this form, I still want you to list that steps and staff worked the camp. I do not need to know what you got paid. I'm primarily concerned with what we paid our student athletes and our non and employees. I have to make sure that we are not paying our student athletes for work they did not perform, that we're, they're not getting paid extra based on their athletic ability. I have to make sure that our junior college coaches, our travel coaches, and high school coaches are not getting paid more <coughs> based on their ability to bring us top recruits or the amount of kids that they brought to camp. So please make sure that this is submitted to us as well. Um, and I'm going to be double checking a lot more of this with Denise and double checking to make sure that our records are accurate. So this is important. Um, I'm gonna tinker with sending out calendar reminders for when these forms are due, kind of like what I'm doing with the jump forward forms right now, so that you have those reminders that are triggered. So once we start going through the approval process for camps, we'll start sending calendar invites to remind you of when these forms are going to be due to our office. Uh, for men's and women's basketball, we have some additional restrictions with fee structures. So all of your camps have to have si similar registration procedures, logistical experiences, and fee structures. So I'll be asking for a little bit more financial information for your camps this summer, just to make sure that everything's consistent. Um, we'll get you a template to use for that, which will again also help with your budgeting and help with Denise and Alicia's responsibilities. Uh, Jump Forward is what we're using for camp registration. You can do team camp registration and jump forward. There is a module for that that's set up where the coach can pay for everybody or the coach registers and they send it out to individual participants to pay. You should be using jump forward to register all of your camp participants. We should not be on paper registration anymore. If you're doing walk-up registration, you can set a walk-up window for when that camp registration reopens and have a laptop on site or computer on site and register them as they arrive. If you are um, doing any manual entries, so any paper registration, which I do not want to see anymore without our approval, you have to manually enter those campers into Jump Forward. We are using Jump Forward to reconcile everything. We're using it for camp rosters. We're using it for finance. Every single participant has to be in Jump Forward. So we're not just taking team names anymore. We need to have every single camper Sometimes we have people who like they'll email last minute and say we can't come to this prospect call. Yeah. And so rather than give them a refund, they'll say, hey, can we just bump our registration to the next one? Mm -hmm. um, the hard part becomes like if the next camp hasn't been approved or set up yet. Mm -hmm. So how would you want us to? 
have those when you're filling out your free or reduced admissions form for that second camp list that we rolled it over from the first camp so, so that they had a credit. It'll be a credit for them because we won't have an exact transaction in our export. We just go ahead and list that so that we have all the accurate records. And then if, if it's past the window of refunds through Jump Forward, then you have to do a check requisition through AP to refund those funds. What's the uh, There's not necessarily a refund. Well, I'm whenever you close your camp, can you go oh. back in and Jump Forward and refund that? No, not once, once, once we withdraw the money, once we, we withdraw can't touch it again. Once we yeah. release the yeah, once so we release the refunds go through when we release the funds. Is that correct? Through jump forward. Through jump forward. You can back. still refund. Yes, as long as you haven't released funds, you can always refund through jump forward. But then they won't get the actual money back on their credit card until we release the funds. No, they get money yeah, back. Yeah, What's what's the topic? Because I did that and I, people are like, hey, where's my money? And you know, we did it last week. I'm sure. It we can follow up with Cody on that too because they've made a lot of changes to their camp module okay. on the back end in the last few weeks even because they had to send me these screenshots of how they okay. operate the camps. Um, so I can follow up on that if we know the specific person and also get a time frame for that and we'll include that in Mike's information that we send out. Yeah. But once you release the funds, then you have to go through Um, one other thing, if you are donating any camp admissions, so free camp admissions to a fundraiser, to an auction, those have to be approved by me before they go out. Use the memorabilia request form for that. Uh, I don't care if you make certificates, I don't care what they look like, but I do have to have that approval before it is donated out at all. And those are going to be probably manual entries and to jump forward when they register for camps too. Um, and I don't know because this was new. Um, there was a camp last summer that sold like their own t-shirts, like a fundraising type of thing. Um, so it wasn't really camp revenue, um, but I think we ended up just putting those funds back into their operating budget. Do you know, Cheryl? Was it lacrosse? Was it lacrosse that sold? standpoint too. Yeah, yep. it was just like, I don't know, like old t-shirts and yeah. stuff like that. But um, yeah, I didn't count it as camp revenue because it was for fundraise, fundraising for their I would say it was just going to other revenue. Other revenue. Yeah. That was me last year. The accident happened when we were doing this camp or something was after camp and the recruit, I don't even know the actual one because we are doing job on the next year. Mm -hmm. And if you want to buy a volatile specific shirt, we don't have one. Additional questions on All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elise. Great question by PJ. All right. Next up, 
Nancy, Chris, you want to get a, a HR forms and camp forms and hiring and hourly wages and whatever you feel like you want to. How many times you've talked about this? I'm sure. Mike, I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, do our notaries and our concession staff workers have to have background checks as well? Um, that's a question I'm going to ask Nancy later. At, at, we'll discuss a little bit more about that question because it comes down to it. I'll probably bring in Terry in that um, because the, the general statute was if there's any interaction with minors, it, that's how the minor policy um, works. So, but we have already on campus. We have already employees. Yeah. I know that Yvette is and I really do that. JJ. And those people need to be listed on the Well, I'll find out more information. Notary, concessions workers, selling gear, everything. You're up. <laughs> so, guys, uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Chris Chelberg. I'm the Assistant Director of Total Rewards and Human Resources. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the legal basis for um, some of the decisions we made as far as how you get your um, camp employees paid. And then I'll turn it over to Nancy, who will talk to you a little bit more about the actual physical act of getting them registered, signed up um, in the, the system and, and able to be paid. Um, there are two main laws that, that kind of intertwine uh, to that affect how we have to pay most of your camp workers. Um, the first is the Fair Labor Standards Act. The Fair Labor Standards Act is a federal law that dictates um, the right of the employee to be paid at least minimum wage and to be paid overtime for hours worked over 40. Um, there are certain uh, standards that can be met for positions that would allow us to exempt certain employees from those provisions. So for example, if you're a coach here at the institution, you're exempt from overtime minimum wage. Congratulations. Um, uh, your camp employees, for the most part, are going to be hourly employees under the FLSA definitions. Um, what that means is we have to make sure that we are paying them at least minimum wage and that we have to properly compensate them for each and every hour that they work. The FLSA defines what we mean by work time. I know some of you guys have overnight camps, um, day-long camps. You have kind of a mix of those things. Um, the basic rule of thumb from the FLSA is if the person that's working for you can control their time, meaning they have the ability to not do something for you, they can go off on their own and do their own thing, that's not considered paid time. Um, so for example, uh, if it's an overnight camp, the time that the um, person spends sleeping is their time. So you don't have to pay them for time spent sleeping. However, if they have to wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning to deal with a sick kid or some sort of issue that has come up, the clock starts and you have to pay them for that time. So you have to be very careful about making sure that we properly account for each and every hour that they work <coughs> Um, the reason for that is if we, if we don't pay them appropriately, we're A, incurring a liability for the university, um, B, we have the potential to be um, fined or investigated by the Department of Labor, and we don't want either one of those things. Uh, I've always said if the DOL shows up on campus to start auditing us, there'll be a Chris-shaped hole in the door because I don't want to be here to see the result of what that is. Um, so we want to be very, very careful to make sure that we are properly articulating um, when people work. And if you have any questions about that, please feel free to give me a call. The second law ties in with the first. Um, it's the, affordable, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. You probably know it better as Obamacare. Um, one of the reasons that we have to make sure that we are properly accounting for hours is um, we have to run an average calculation of employee hours for the year for our reporting period to determine who we are legally required to offer health insurance benefits to. So um, the standard rule here at the university is that we do not want part-time employees working more than 29 hours per week. 
that means that if you are operating a camp, especially an overnight camp for, say, five days or a week, you may need to consider hiring more staff than you initially thought you might need to be able to keep those part-time employees under that 29-hour threshold. The reason for that is if we hit an average hour period over 29 hours, we have to offer them health insurance at that point. That's a cost to the university and specifically a cost to the athletics um, uh, budget as far as compensation goes. Um, beyond that, once they drop down below that hours, we then have to offer them COBRA, and there's a COBRA administration fee that you guys are responsible for. And if they cycle back through it again, we have to turn off COBRA, which also has an associated fee, and then we go back to paying them again for insurance. So we don't want to go over that 29-hour threshold. It's just not a good idea. So you want to do some pre-planning ahead of time if you're having um, overnight camps or if you're having um, you know, even multi-day camps to think about how many staff you will need if the cap on hours for them is that 29 hours. Yes, sir? No, you're fine. Correct. So if they have other jobs at the university, um, if they are part-time employees in other capacities, whether they're a student employee elsewhere, um, whether they are um, a staff member that you picked up to assist you, uh, those hours are cumulative. Now, if they're a full-time employee of the university and they're assisting you with the camp, you don't need to worry about that part of it. Um, we do need to make sure if they're a non-exempt staff member that we're paying them on an hourly basis and, and that they get their overtime rate if they're working more than 40 hours a week. Um, but if they're an exempt employee that's helping you out, you're perfectly fine to pay them on a stipend basis. Um, you're perfectly fine to not have to worry about accounting for their hours for that period. Yes, sir? I don't, I don't think some people are aware of that because I, like, for all the PAFs that we fill out, pay my non-exempt staff members, that is Again, we're talking about the intersection of two laws. So what Denise is saying is we have to properly account for his time, even though he's a part-time exempt employee, because we may exceed that 29-hour threshold where we have to pay him health insurance. So we have to have a record of those hours for part-time employees, no matter what context they're in, whether they're exempt or not exempt. Yes, sir? Do you have any coach that's a volunteer? Is that you can volunteer anything under 29 or um, Volunteer coaches, so I assume he's not an employee of ours, correct? He's employed elsewhere and he volunteers here. Okay. Are you talking about the one that works in the facility? Okay, so he is a full time employee, but he volunteers with them. Okay, so he's a full time employee in another capacity. He doesn't work for athletics, he doesn't no. work in coaching in any way, shape, or form. He's just volunteering. Either way, doesn't matter. Um, if he's volunteering in a context outside of his normal job, we can treat him just as a volunteer. You're allowed to have him volunteer to do whatever. As long as we're not paying him for the camps or anything else. If it's strictly volunteer, yeah. Yeah. he would get a stipend. Yeah. But okay. still, they still, we still put hourly rate and they still have a, their own position for In that camp. situation, what I would suggest, send me an email about him on what you plan to do in advance of you working him and I can kind of guide you through that. Because once we pay him, it starts to get a little tricky as to whether he can be a volunteer in the future um, based on how much we pay him. So um, just send me an email, let me know what you want to do, and I can work through that with you individually. But for the purpose of NCAA legislation, if they're a volunteer coach, what HR has to do doesn't adjust their standing on our budget designation. Because they're not a full-time, they're not an athletics department employee by NCAA's definition. So legally, we're in a different situation. HR is different, but from a compliance standpoint, Brandon's not going to trigger possible coach status if Chris has to do paperwork. Yeah. Absolutely, those two things are 
strictly separate because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's all I really needed to cover. Are there any questions about any of that? If you have a situation that comes up um, where you want to make sure that you're accounting for hours properly, uh, you want to send me a schedule and have me look at it and tell you how many hours I think somebody might be working. Um, you have a question about a coach who's volunteering or whether you have to or don't have to pay somebody a certain way, feel free to email me or give me a call. And I am happy to make sure that we do that correctly so that we stay in compliance the whole time. I'm going to turn over to Nancy. She's going to talk to you a little bit about how you actually get your people hired, background checked, and get them uh, in to be paid. Thanks, guys. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I think some of the stuff that I might go over might be a little repetitive because it's been touched on at different points, um, but we'll go through it again. If nothing else, it just reinforces everything. Um, identifying your camp workers, obviously, Mike has said, make sure you get that information to him. He will then um, get it over to me. I will make sure that they have had background checks within the past 24 months if they haven't. We'll have to run a background check. They are taking anywhere between seven to 10 days for a domestic person, if it's an international person. Then they have to fill out a whole nother set of forms that have to be sent to the background checking company, and it becomes much more involved. So if you know if any of your staff is international, the sooner you can get that to me, the better. Um, <coughs> if the person is going to be doing um, any kind of driving, driving students, whether um, in any capacity, if they're going to be doing driving, um, they will need to have their um, license uh, checked to make sure that there's no um, infractions and that we can insure them. Um, so please make sure that you complete, and I, and I have some forms here for you, but um, this, is, this is actually our old authorization form to do a background check, which we don't need for background checks anymore, but we are using this for the MVR checks. So I would need this completed and a copy of their driver's license so that we can get that squared away and make sure